Well, hello and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Blood Axe Books launch event. My name is John Chalice. I'm a poet published by Blood Axe, and I'm stepping in this evening for the Blood Axe editor, Neil Astley, who is unfortunately unable to join us. Sadly, Neil is stranded in France, returning from vacation due to a car breakdown. We wish him well and hope he's back on the road very soon. It's a pleasure to be hosting this evening's launch event featuring Jen Campbell, Courtney Conrad and Nicole Seeley. The three poets will be reading two short sets each in that order, Jen followed by Courtney followed by Nicole, and then the four of us will come together for a discussion about their work. If you're watching live and have a question for the poets, please feel free to drop that in the chat and type permitting we will do our best to answer any questions you might have. The new books by all poets are available for purchase from the Blood X Books website, and you should find a link on the YouTube page. This evening, we're also sharing the link to a foundation set up in memory of the celebrated and beloved poet, Biega Udabanjo, who suddenly and tragically passed away recently. The foundation will continue his legacy by supporting low-income black writers and we hope you can consider making a contribution. So now on to this evening's readings. First up this evening, we have Jen Campbell, who joins us from London. Jen's first collection, The Girl Aquarium, was published by Blood Axe in 2019. And tonight, Jen is launching her second collection, Please Do Not Touch This Exhibit, which is a Poetry Book Society recommendation. So please welcome Jen Campbell. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Um, this is the first time that I'm talking about Please Do Not Touch This Exhibit. And you would think that this being my 12th book, I would be better at this. But I feel whenever a new book comes out, you go through a process of learning how to externalize it. Writing a book by yourself is very different to presenting it to other people. So bear with me as I try and do that this evening. I don't mean to use you as guinea pigs. Um, I first started writing Please Do Not Touch This Exhibit two years ago, about two years ago, or at least that was when I started purposefully writing it and bringing it all together. Um, at that point, my husband and I have been, it had been four years since we'd had our first IVF appointment. And I think when you're thinking about parenthood, you inevitably start to think about your childhood more. Um, I'm a disabled person. I grew up in and out of hospital having dozens of operations. So I, I wanted to write about that and the way that we storytell our lives and try and make sense of things and contrast that with going through IVF as a disabled adult. And um, so I just wanted to chat a little bit about the collection before reading two poems and then I'll read more in the, the second set as well. Um, I started writing, as I said, two years ago and I knew I would finish winter 2022 because that was when my my deadline was and I knew that either at that point I could be pregnant or not be um wherever my body found itself the book would have to meet me there and I, I wasn't pregnant in winter 2022 so it was a weird time to be writing a strange time but also I felt a very vital time it was very um cathartic so the book the poem that I would like to start with I'm going to share my screen so that you can um read it as I read it to you if you would like to see it in that way there we go um a bit of context for this poem so this is anatomy of the sea which is one of the first poems in the collection um I was born nine months after Chernobyl and doctors told my parents that it was because of Chernobyl that I was born with a disability that I have there was a noted increase in babies born with limb differences in the northeast of England in the years after Chernobyl. Um, I have something called EEC syndrome, which affects all parts of my body, the linings of my organs, my hair. That's where I wear fabulous wigs these days because I have alopecia. Um, my eyes, my hands, I was essentially born without fingers and doctors had to craft them for me. Whether or not it's because of Chernobyl is kind of a, a moot point. That was just it became the law. It was almost like this folkloric thing that was said about my disability and it's always kind of been in the back of my brain and I remember as a teenager watching the film The Hills Have Eyes which I'm sure many of you have seen and for some reason I remember that as being about Chernobyl but it is not about Chernobyl I looked it up when I was writing this poem and 
Um, it's a horror film about people who have disabilities and disfigurements because of a nuclear experiment. They have their own community. They have become very aggressive and they um, assault people who come anywhere near them. And I remember watching this film and thinking, I hate this. <laughs> like, I hate that this is the representation of disability that we see in the media, that it's scary and to be feared and something horrific. And a couple of years after that, I saw an interview with Michael Berryman, who's one of the actors in the original The Hills Have Eyes. And he has ectodermal dysplasia, which is the same disability that I have. He's in his 70s and he's always been cast in horror films um, as a person to be feared because of the way he looks. And in this interview, he was talking about how his dad was in Hiroshima after the nuclear bomb there and how he was born just after that. And I, it blew my mind that this man was born with ectodermal dysplasia, probably because of Hiroshima. And I had been told I'd been born with ectodermal dysplasia so many years later, possibly because of Chernobyl. Um, and I don't know, it kind of, all of those things came together in my brain and this poem happened. So I'm gonna start by reading this one. And then the following poem is about my time in hospital, but kind of, I guess, a mythologized version of that. So, Anatomy of the Sea. The rain falls in Northern England and still the women dig deeper for their children. They rip fingertips below the greenhouses, bellow in the soil and marvel at the wet, wet earth so much like the sea of which they are afraid. Not Mother Earth, not the bearer or the ark nor the trees. No, they search the soil for seeds and they are thankful. They are grateful. It's only after that my mother is grave. Nine months later, I am clawed from the sea, a river child, a lobster baby. Oh, they say, oh, all fingers and thumbs, my blanket petrichor, and we drown in genetics. Late at night, my friends and I are watching the hills have eyes, and I know that I am the only body horrified. They dare each other to run outside, but I stay put, my meat heart pounding, monster, monster, monstrous. In an Airbnb in Copenhagen, my husband and I watch the TV show Chernobyl. Jared Harris and Emily Watson are saving the world, but its people are burning and I have rage, the likes of which you would not believe. The April before I arrived, men were godlike in their mistakes, obsessed with their creations. Now my hands are birds, elephants, rock sort, constellations, anemone. Listen to me. Until the 1800s, anyone with a disfigurement was medically called a monster. Somewhere, oh, sorry, somewhere I am certain, Mary Shelley stands on a mountaintop, commanding the clouds. It has stormed for weeks and she has lost for words, haunted by images of a jigsawed man. We all look skywards, seawards, see the tumbling birds, feel the damp soil inking into our feet. This is where we were meant to meet. We mother hunt for hours in the flesh of the earth. We plant ourselves firmly and cross our numbered digits. Then, oh, then we summon the rain. The hospital is not my house. The hospital is not a place for geography. The girl swims out of the x-ray machine and climbs into the Colosseum, by which we mean the proscenium, by which we mean the operating theater. The blue magicians roll up their sleeves and plant trees to decide where her body should be, a sapling here, a root pulled there. They label all her countries, lick a paintbrush across the borders, hire Victorian seams dresses to cover the skin where her colors don't match. Their act requires a metal pole they stole from a sailing ship and this they shove beneath her skin and motorize. They blow a whistle and her bones dance. Her hip is now a palm, is now a web, is now a waltz. They puppet so by hand, stand and tuck the girl inside an orange boat. As the curtain falls, they propel her into deeper waters with the lions and the warriors, clean forgetting she is still sound asleep. The hospital is not a place for literature. The lights are out and the young girl tiptoes to the edge of a tree, by which we mean the edge of a bed, by which we mean the edge of a corridor where she is searching for the bathroom. The bathroom being the wet field that half hides the moon, half asleep. The girl questions how she can hold the moon when she cannot hold anything, when she is grafted to herself into this building, when her new skin slips for she is wearing. She is wearing satin pajamas to stop the stitches catching. She is wearing satin pajamas to be a fish and her hips are now part of her hands and the forest grips her feet. 
The trees have her. As the bedsheets flash the light from the sea to help her find her way back along the pebbled ward, she finds the moon for a moment, hovering gently above the sink, a giant rock pool or a swollen mother, and she allows the current to pull her swiftly back to bed. Thank you very much, Jen, for that very wonderful introduction to your powerful new collection. And we look forward to hearing more from that book shortly. So next we have Courtney Conrad, who also joins us from London. Courtney will be reading from I Am Evidence, which is the winner of the 2022 Miss Lexia Women's Poetry Pamphlet Competition, judged this year by Imtiaz Darka. Blood Axe is delighted to have taken over as Miss Lexia's publishing partner for the pamphlet competition. So please welcome Courtney Conrad. Hi everyone, good evening. Uh, first of all, glory to God for allowing me to finish this book. Um, I'd first like to start my set uh, by reading a poem by Boego Odubandro. Um, this is actually the first poem I've ever heard um, Boyega read um, years ago at Poet in the City. So this is John 19, 28. Pour me water, please. Pour some water on me. I've been thirsting for everyone. Pour me by the pint. Pour me out, oh, pour me silly. I've been talking awful fallow, skin too ashy, tongue dry. Pour me something sweet. Pour me sick, pour me on me. I've been thirsting for everything. Pour me by the gallon, pour me stupid. I've been thirsting something of me, please everything on me. I've been talking awful idle. I've been trifling, pour me fat, pour me empty. Thank you. And now I'm gonna read some of my own pieces from I Am Evidence. Uh, the first piece um, is In the Trenches, which is a poem I wrote during lockdown, wanting to, you know, praise single mothers. Um, and I think single mothers and mothers on a whole are the backbone of Jamaica. So this is um, a big up to single mothers in Jamaica. In the Trenches, Bellies ball out like mongrels, but hot girl no walk a street and beg. Mother drive youths round with gas tanks swirling droplets like bear keg. Searching for nine night with no guest list, serving meaty manish water and steam fish. Before school runs, mother creeps out to rough up ATMs, tears, grease debit cards. Empty hands send slack jaw youths to breakfast clubs for ackee dumpling and tea. At dinner time, she scouts supermarket aisles. He didn't know, say water bill, could a rat bully beef? And pockets can turn measuring cup full of flour. Youths empty mother's money stash pot while landlords bold cutter hands vanish padlocks. Bedtime reach them in at the parking lot. Mother and youths interlock like Tetris blocks upon the back seat. Mother say youths them are for yeet, even if there must be a kneeling. Thank you. And the next poem is a poem I kind of wanted to write about the push factor that ultimately uh, led me to migrate. Um, and it was regarding the extradition of drug lord Dudas Coke and just the battle between law enforcement um, and the gangs in Jamaica. So this is extradition of drug lord Dudas Coke, Barbican girl, Dashra Tivoli boy. Dudas. Breath taker of dirty youths preying on liquor girls' cell phones and chochos. He pretzels politicians' arms so fathers can teeth light to keep stoves on. His cash lines the bras of single mothers who send their sons to your school with their A-stars, waves, and Clark shoes. 
Prime Minister Bruce Golding approves Dudas's extradition. Your principal's intercom interrupts lunchtime. Year group becomes a herd of whispers, shuffling to collect bags, airs cock for loose lips on staff walkie talkies. Everyone sprints to their drivers. Your boy shoves himself into a Tivoli Chichi bus that mounts sidewalks to get him home, while your Barbican Prado cruises to water polo training. At training, with every other stroke, you glance at the plumes of smoke in the distance coming from Tivoli. Police helicopters chopping your coach's commands. You have three missed calls from your boy. You listen to his voicemail when you get home. He says, Jano, me no know if me and my family them are gonna make it. If me dead and them say, me did shoot after police, I lie them I tell. Meanwhile, in the name of President Dudus, Tivoli gunmen bust shot after shot, not even a spot check for grannyless verandas. Scrap vehicles and gas cylinders block cherry stained streets. Your boy's eardrums grind like pimento. His little sister and brother's squeals stow in their kitchen cupboards. From his room window, he prees. Three of his brethren plead the blood of Jesus as they sit in their own pooling. While rumors have it, on the ground, Dudus is a sewer rat wearing a stiff wig for disguise. The next day, Prime Minister calls a state of emergency for Tivoli. You neither adjust nor die, but your boy vanishes for a while. You ramp next to his empty desk, ask about his whereabouts, but not enough. In the Tivoli community, Mothers are graduating from sniffing foreheads, green armpits to heaving at compost flesh. Top lips marrying snotty nose tips, single beds, open caskets. Thank you. And thank you, Courtney, for that very powerful reading as well, uh, for our second very powerful reading this evening. Um, so moving on to our third poet of the evening, we have Nicole Seeley, who joins us from Brooklyn. Nicole is launching two books this evening, Ordinary Beast and The Ferguson Report and Erasure, an extract of which won the Ford Prize for Best Poem in 2021. Both books, her first and second collection, are Nicole's first to be published in the UK. Please welcome Nicole Seeley. Thank you for that introduction, John. And thank you to both Jen and Courtney um, for your beautiful readings. Thank you to Blood Axe for publishing uh, these books. And it's what a pleasure it is to launch today with uh, these two women. Uh, so I'm gonna read from the Ferguson Report and Erasure. Uh, for those who don't know what the Ferguson Report is, um, after Michael Brown was murdered by a Ferguson police officer, the department, the US Department of Justice filed a report detailing the bias policing and court practices in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, so I began to erase that document and an erasure is a reconsideration of an existing text by erasing it. What remains is a wholly new creative work. So I'm going to read from this book uh, a few of the excerpts, the first of which uh, is pages 1 to 12. Forces, hundreds, neighing, part reflex, part reason, part particular urge, at gunpoint among them, you are. Less likely to live into the wild go the captive born. Home in the high grass, a barking dog chokes itself against the pull of a tight leash, its neck extending farther than cries for help. A kind of headlight echoing, increasing in reach. The forecast red, the city red, 
diminishing to the proportion of whoever said death comes in threes is an optimist. Pages 13 to 21. Then the birds began to fly low and patternless as if they were each two hands joined, just pretending at birds. The soft music from passing cars shouting down the soft music of their dying. Stop, hands where I can see, a boy pretends to pray. His mark makes of her hands a bird and flies away. Stop or I'll shoot, he kids, then makes of his hands a gun, fires away. Pages 22 to 34. In the bushes next to the lot across the street, a rustling, like back talk, a deer, the animal out of nowhere flees, seconds too late, a design oversight assigned to that particular beast. On the police radio, a song, a threat, a slip of tongue in an ear, moist as an eye. Approached, the deer stiffens, a telltale sign the conditions under which it ran we're breaking the skin. Worse, training the mind. Who among us is stunned by how fast rain pours from the sky? Stunned by how the sky, clear at first, self-corrects, as if to say, I mean this, not that. That, not this. Pages 35 to 39. Use of force, force of habit, of nature, force feed, force down, force his hand, force in line, full force, by force, show of force, brute force, blunt force to be reckoned with, force a smile as law enforcement turns out in force, to force, open your door. Pages 40 to 49. With the living, I am familiar. A woman stretches the truth to disappear it, throws her voice to animate it, as when I imagine the word was made flesh. I've been trying to scrape up what I remember. One, 1,100 stems, long, headless. Two, a few bad apples. Three, reports of a stolen pickup. You put down one color, Bearden thought, and it calls for an answer. What's an answer to black, I wonder? Pages 50 to 64. As for men lying face down in the street, knees on their necks, their hands behind their backs, laboring like babies on their bellies trying to crawl, then stiff as a dime down after a toss in the air, tails, sea heads, heads, execution on the basis of fact, including the fact if true with the caption, pass out, motherfuck. An idea came to me this morning like an honest mistake. It's sundown here. The day almost entirely extinguished closes its casket's crown after bearing gifts as pointed as its teeth. Pages 65 to 77. They say stand in line, so we stand in line. As the line advances, they say, stand still. Around us, everything going, going like cars or clouds. Us, the blur cars pass, the blue clouds damn. 
They say, wait, so we wait. As if for some fragrant flower that unfurls one night a year. They say, shh. So like trees, we mouth cross sounds of flags beaten to shreds by wind. Our heads twitch, birds watching for what might be stalking. Right before they deploy canines to bite, there's a pause between whales in which you hear your shut eyes dilate. Listen. And thank you very much, Nicole. It's, it's wonderful to hear the lifted poems from that erasure. And, and I look forward to talking about that in the second part of this evening. So now we're going to cycle back and hear second readings from our three poets. So please welcome back Jen Campbell. Thanks, John. It's lovely to hear Courtney and Nicole read because I've read the books and love them, but hearing you read from them is extra special. Um, a few years ago, I read a book called The House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods by Matt Bell, which is a novel about a couple who are trying to conceive and it's not working for them. And the wife, she burrows under their house and she creates all these underground rooms and she fills them with her grief in a magical way. So one room will be filled, if my memory serves me correctly, with just bees, but silent bees. And then one room would be filled with just the sound of bees. And I thought that was a wonderful way of expressing grief and how we compartmentalize it and give it a home. And then a couple of years after that, and I'm going to butcher what he said because I'm doing this from memory, so I'm sorry, Andrew, but Andrew McMillan was talking on Instagram about, um, he was answering a question about when you know a poetry collection is finished. And he said in some form <laughs> that he thinks of a book like a house. And if he's entered the house all the ways he could through all the doors and all the windows, and if he's visited every room and looked in every nook and cranny, if he's explored it in its entirety, then the book is finished. And I also thought that was a wonderful way of thinking about creating a piece of work. And I think those two things have kind of married in my head a little bit. And when I was writing this book, we were also moving house. So that definitely fed into it as well. But I decided to create a series of poems within Please Do Not Touch This Exhibit, which is about a house, which I guess, I guess is my, my body as a house. And that house changing color throughout the collection and changing form and being observed in different ways, um, I guess, to reflect the fact that I was trying to make a home for a child, but also how we observe houses if we're looking to move and have to make quick judgments on them based on this very brief viewing in the same way that doctors can make very uh, quick assumptions about bodies in um, examinations without maybe having an entire medical history. So I thought I would read some of those um, house body poems here. And then I'm going to finish with a poem um, which was inspired by Liz Berry's work. Liz Berry, um, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with her. She's an amazing poet. And one of my favorite poems, well, I was going to say by her, but ever, is called The Republic of Motherhood. So um, that's about motherhood in the first few days, weeks, months of motherhood in particular. But I wrote a response poem to that about IVF. So I'm going to read the body house poems and then that one. And I'm going to share the screen so you can see those poems. At first, the house is blue. I don't think I need to explain that it is winter as I approach the house. The blue curtains don't just cover the windows, they also curtain the grass. The lawn leaks, it's waterlogged felt and walking across it is licking velvet. I wouldn't recommend it, but it is the only way to reach the house. This house with its blue door and its blue brain, which if I had to, I would draw as a sea of traffic lights or perhaps as some kind of whale. For a while, the house is green. So green, I think I might be able to eat it. So green, I guess a giant may have a hand in it. Green smoke from the chimney, green teeth in the window boxes, then beneath the stretch of lawn, the flesh composting down. We must admit the house is pink. In fact, it is a fleshy, peachy, stitched up bouncy castle. 
we are aware that the adverts in the catalogue may have been misleading. We hope that you know that on any other day we would invite you in for revelations, but we appear to have misplaced the front door and all the windows are now shuttered, closed. We're deeply embarrassed about this loss of control. We hope to find you another home. In my dream, the house is dark. This could be because my eyes are closed, but more likely it is because the house is now an X-ray. The house is taken to watching films about deep sea fish, those who have their insides out, and it is realized it needs to show me its precious wooden skeleton. It uses oil lamps to highlight areas where particular care is needed, then does a silly dance to take the edge off the haunted feeling. So as not to seem rude, I hum along to the familiar tune and try not to wake up until the house has decided it has done enough and settles on its haunches, its carcass fizzing in the dark. Trying to gain entry into the Republic of Motherhood after Liz Berry. I asked across the border into the Republic of Motherhood and found myself in a waiting room, an overgrown waiting room. When my name was called, I took off my clothes and I let them scan me, knowing these borrowed instruments were used by the already mothers, searching the waters for their seal-like babes. I removed my wig and shuffled down their bed, they parted my legs, relaying their instructions, then sent me to work on the farmland of motherhood. I stabbed myself twice daily, injecting resilience, collecting purple blue badges as prizes to claim access to the Republic of Motherhood. My body bloomed, turned itself into a chicken, my heartbeat going boom, boom, boom as drugs spooled through the factory of my body. I mentally decorated our home to make room for us all. As required, every week, I sat with my sisters in the passport office at the Department of Motherhood. None of us looked sideways, but all of us loved each other. Surely, I thought, I would die for these women and their carefully chosen leggings. I would die for their frantic calendars and their nervous laughter. And if I could, I would stamp every single visa, cry out that we should storm the royal banquet to which we had not yet been invited, and stuff ourselves with riches before declaring our corridor a part of their country. But no. No, that is not what we did. We patiently queued, then we got back to work. Cherry angiomas freckling our skin, our bloated bellies hungry, so hungry, they rumbled all shift long. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jen, for sharing us with that second reading from your book. It's wonderful to hear that particular thread of house-related poems in the book. And, and thank you, too, for your generous descriptions of, of the poetry collection as house, but the body as house, most importantly. Um, I'd like to now please welcome back Courtney Conrad. Hi, everyone. Um... I will, I'll do teeth like puss and it's essentially, I read a, um, a newspaper article regarding some rental scams and yeah, that's kind of how this poem came about. So this is teeth like puss. Outside your old home, in the car, you both play tic-tac-toe in the classified section of the newspaper. The eviction notice hangs like panty on a clothesline. Your mother's pride, a cracked peg under the landlord's feet. Viewings, all roads that gulp gas and never lead home. Yet, in the 11th hour, a faultless apartment appears. Two women welcome you, barefoot comfortable, feeding you fresh fruit skewers from the fridge. There is silence throughout your tour. No warrior neighbors, only bakers who gift fresh batches. Your fingers roam across luxurious art frames and furniture, fantasizing about future sleepovers. Your inner child hulks in the living room. The women pat you on the head and say you can have it all, excluding the poodle. Pay today, K 
keys tomorrow. You say this is crazy, as in an outlandish miracle. Your mother says this is funny, as in off, but her nose are exhausted. You can't help but remember how their tongue slit the lining of your mother's purse, emptying her last. This is the first time you see your mother surrender her commotion. No search for mercy, not a Jesus cross, nor rotted, just shrugging shoulders and siren sighs. The house claims several families in one day. Uh, the next piece I'll do is titled Puss and Dog Nab the Same Lock. My brother's bodies are shell holders for bullets. I escape staring into the barrel. My bulletproof vest is the US-Mexico border. Birthing two girls makes me willing to fold our bodies like garments to stuff a barrel. Midway to becoming US residents, I call mama with an unclear voice as if speaking while gargling water. Only can't stop praying now. We reach. Thank you, Father God. Scratch that. I am an inmate and only two of us are alive. My five-year-old is a nameless doll floating somewhere out there. I remember clutching my Bible while walking past bones. No water nor spit left to drink. So hungry, cacti consume our stomachs. I can't remember my last glimpse of Kami, just the running, the guard dogs, dirt bikes and helicopters hunting us. I carry that river in my eyes every day. Now Kami lives in two places at once, spirit by the Colorado River, body resting in Jamaica. Next piece is Model and No Wawi again. Rebuild, rebuild, rebuild. When you hear what the Queen of England said, she said, me for come with my whole family. My stush stride follows 400 to board the ship. I wave goodbye to gully pools and low hanging meals. My youth doodles postcards by my feet. Home, a cherry seed. HMT Empire Windrush docks in Essex, spit and slurs unwelcome me, my black nurse face a toilet bowl for white folks bedpans, my husband a cleaner dodging Molotov cocktails, leave, leave, leave. Only hear what the Prime Minister say, she say, me for go back on my yard and take my whole family. The home office's charter flight to Jamaica is the first time I rebuke freeness. Muscle memory goes back 30 years. My face pressed to the window as the airplane lands. Distant relatives collect me and tour me around the housing scheme. I pit stop to grin at old faces. That holler, Pinky, are you that? Welcome home, girl. Restore, restore, restore. In bed, I toss and turn thinking about tomorrow. Must go to the registrar's general's department for the birth certificate. Tax administration Jamaica for the TRN. Supermarket for the toothbrush, panty and deodorant. Babylon want to know in a Rasta mouse. Step in a one dance for all the meds and the MC ball out. Ja! Rastafari, praise to the most. Before him, a sea of tweed caps clutch locks. Button down linen shirts flaunt chest hairs and gold chains. This cramped garage sanctuary for slow sways, prayerful eyes and ganja. Okra tongues provoke Bosey Boy's peace. He backs out a cutlass like a handkerchief. MC send a war to a thing, just love and unity and the Irie vibes carry on. 
blonde neighbor, summons her pack and bars Jesus off of the cross like say lions approach through the sound system. Babylon's batons bash doors, their speaky spoky accent turn off this racket. Rass them disperse like madans. Some faces get catch on the Babylon's boots. Speaky spoky accent, go back to your country. If flattened bodies on concrete could have make a boat, Babylon spit would have sent them sailing home long time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Courtney, for that second wonderful reading. And it's great to hear more of the poems from I Am Evidence. And following them along on the screen, I, I feel lucky that I get to, to look at these poems as, as I'm hearing them as well, because there is some very innovative things happening on the page as well, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, so please welcome Nicole Seeley. Um, I was saying it's so great to be here again and to hear these poems, um, to hear them come to life. Both Jen and Courtney, they've read my faves from their books. So I'm just so uh, honored to be here and to be part of this. I'm gonna read a few poems from my debut collection um, out this year from Blood Acts, starting with Hysterical Strength. When I hear news of a hitchhiker struck by lightning yet living, or a child lifting a two-ton sedan to free his father pinned underneath, or a camper fighting off a grizzly with her bare hands until someone, a hunter perhaps, can shoot it dead. My thoughts turn to black people, the hysterical strength we must possess to survive our very existence, which I fear many believe is and treat as itself a freak occurrence. I don't think any of these poems um, require any further explanation, so I'm just gonna power through and read some poems. This is called Even the Gods. Even the gods misuse the unfolding blue. Even the gods misread the wind flowers nod towards sunlight as consent to consume. Still, you envy the horse that draws their chariot, bone of their bone. The wilting mash of air alone keeps you from scaling Olympus with gifts of dead or dying things dangling from your mouth. Your breath like the sea inching away. It is rumored gods grow where the blood of a hanged man drips. You insist on being this man. The gods abuse your grace. Still, you'd rather live among the clear cloudless white, enjoying what is left of their ambrosia. Who should be happy this time? Who brings cake to whom? Pray the gods do not misquote your covetous pulse for chaos, the black from which they were conceived. Even the eyes of gods must adjust to light. Even gods have gods. This is called Imagine Sisyphus Happy. Give me tonight to be inconsolable, so the death drive does not declare itself. So the moonlight does not convince sunrise. I was born before sunrise. When morning masquerades as night, the temperature of blood quivering like a mouth in mourning. How do we author our gentle birth? The height we were. Were we gods rolling stars across a sundog sky? the same as scarabs. We fit somewhere between God and mineral, angel and animal, believing a thing as sacred as the sun rises and falls like an ordinary beast. Dear sniff lifeless fawns before leaving, elephants encircle the skulls and tusks of their dead 
none wanting to leave the bones behind, none knowing their leave will lessen the loss. But birds pluck their own feathers, dogs lick themselves to wound. Allow me this luxury. Give me tonight to cut and salt the open. Give me a shovel to uproot the mandrake and listen for its scream. Give me a face that toils so closely with stone. It is itself stone. I promise to enter the flesh again. I promise to circle, to ascend. I promise to be happy tomorrow. Just two more from me. Then we can have a conversation. This poem is for my mother and it's called The First Person Who Will Live to Be 150 Years Old Has Already Been Born. Scientists say the average human life gets three months longer every year. By this math, death will be optional, like a tie or dessert or suffering. My mother asks whether I'd want to live forever. I'd get bored, I tell her. But, she says, there's so much to do, meaning she believes there's much she hasn't done. 30 years ago, she was the age I am now, but unlike me, too industrious to think about birds disappeared by rain. If only we had more time or enough money to be kept on ice until such a time, science could bring us back. Of late, my mother has begun to think life short-lived. I'm too young to convince her otherwise. The one and only occasion I was in the same room as the Mona Lisa, it was encased in glass behind what I imagine were velvet ropes. There's far less between ourselves and oblivion, skin that often defeats its very purpose. Or maybe its purpose isn't protection at all, but rather to provide a place similar to a doctor's waiting room in which to sit until our names are called. Hold your questions until the end. Mother, measure my wide open arms. We still have this much time to kill. And my last poem is called Object Permanence. And it's for my husband, John. We wake as if surprised the other is still there, each petting the sheet to be sure. How have we managed our way to this bed, beholden to heat like dawn indebted to light, though we're not so self-important as to think everything has led to this, everything has led to this. There's a name for the animal love makes of us. Named, I think, like rain for the sound it makes. You are the animal after whom other animals are named. Until there's none left to laugh. Days will start with the same startle and end with caterpillars gorged on milkweed. Oh, how we entertain the angels with our brief animation. Oh, how I'll miss you when we're dead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole, uh, for, for that reading from your first collection, Ordinary Beast. Um, so we're now at that part of the evening where we've heard twice from all three poets and I'd like to invite the three poets back to the room now, where we will have a discussion um, about the poems we've heard, about the books that have just been published, 
And also um, now is the time, hopefully, that some of you in the audience might have questions. You may have already posed your question in the chat, but if not, please feel free um, to pop anything in there that you're interested in about this evening's readings. Um, so firstly, I suppose, I suppose to begin us, um, to begin us with the conversation, you know, thank you, thank you, Jen, Nicole, and Courtney for, for those for those you know great readings and, and thank you for these wonderful books that you've given us. Um, I suppose one thing that was coming up in my mind reading the books and obviously hearing you read the poems and and I realize we're only getting a snippet really of, of each of each collection, but was just how the poems speak of different types of trauma and the books speak of different kinds of trauma, whether it be personal or political, uh, witness trauma, trauma of the language, um, trauma done by authority figures. And I'm interested in how, how that manifests itself, both in, in the poems that you write, the subjects you write about, the poems you write, and also the forms, the erasure, um, the, the wonderful, well, wonderful, and very kind of alarming, haunting doctor poems that, that Jen has in her book that, that she didn't read from this evening. And also in, in Courtney's book, in, in one of those poems she just read in the Motherland poem, Courtney has these little tick boxes at the bottom, which, which you know, are really interesting how, how the poem is kind of using this sort of um, iconography or, or typography of forms as well, which also appears in an earlier poem in the book. Um, so um, I don't know who would like to start first. Um, maybe maybe Jen, you might like to say something about about that to, to kick us off, but just about how how your book kind of deals with, I suppose, and approaches uh, writing about these traumatic subjects. That's a big question. <laughs> That's a big question. Um, it's tricky, as I mentioned at the at the very beginning externalizing stuff like that um and when you're writing about something that's very personal putting across enough so that the reader can understand what you're talking about because they don't have the context for you but also um I suppose leaving room for everything else so when I was thinking about form for the book itself as opposed to individual poems I wanted to frame it to give enough context. So I wanted to have the house poems, as I mentioned, as kind of um, benchmarks, I suppose, throughout. And I had requested um, my medical notes from my hospital. And I decided to include extracts from that throughout the book as well, peppered to kind of, I don't know, give it the other voice. So that could be somewhere else in the book but I really one of my favorite things about poetry is is the form of the poem and the geography of the page and I really like playing around with structure in that way there are quite a lot of prose poems in this collection and um, more so I think than in my first one and I love how claustrophobic a prose poem can feel um how the shape of a poem really does change how you read it um, as well so a prose poem can feel quite daunting I suppose I mean I love them but they they can be quite imposing because they're just a block of text and that definitely serves a purpose but then on the flip side I've got poems like alopecia which is a poem about losing my hair and I wanted to have very short lines in that so that it trickles down the page so it mimics you know hair falling out I suppose and it means that you read it quicker as well which I suppose could create a, a feeling of panic <laughs> so um those are some of um my thoughts on the form in my own book. Does anyone else want to take take over? <laughs> I can say a few words. Mm -hmm. um, I am writing uh, through about my obsessions. And so um, the Ferguson Report is one such obsession. Um, you know, love is also one such obsession. And as you all know, a life is comprised of all these things. Um, tragedy and joys and all these um, various uh, states of being. Um, and so I'm writing about, trying to write about all of that uh, and uh, the forms that the poems take, I think for me happen um, very much like Jen in that they happen organically, you know, like the alopecia poem with the short lines mimicking the alopecia itself 
um, I think the poem, that poem warranted that shape. And so for me, the shapes of my poems, um, the poems themselves require that shape. And so I, I think I'm, I'm kind of just going with what the poem is asking of me. Um, and so, um, yeah, yeah, I think the shapes happen organically and that I'm writing about what I'm obsessed with from uh, tragedy to, to love. I think if I, if I can interject, I love how in the Ferguson report, we've got two forms as well. I didn't realize that when I was reading them, the poems would be on their own at the end as well, outside of the report. And it creates completely different readings because when you're reading it at first, you're having to excavate each word and it forces the reader to really spend a lot of time with each syllable. Um, and that has a haunting feeling to it. And then you get to celebrate those words and the, the shape that you've created for the poems themselves at the end individually again. Um, and I, I love that juxtaposition. I thought it was wonderful. Thank you, Jen. Uh, I think for me, um, I while I was doing my MA, which turned out to be some of the pamphlet, uh, I had a dissertation teacher who was obsessed with concrete poetry. Um, so I did a lot of studying of concrete poetry and read a lot of like Gombo Yaya um, and different collect poetry collections that um, play with form a bit, um, that lends to the poem itself. So when it came to writing um, poems like Classified, which has like, it's literally similar to what's in newspaper. Uh, yeah, similarly to what Nicole said, the the form, the poem chose the form. And then similarly again for a poem I have in the book called Snapple. Um, it takes the the form of a recipe. Um, the yeah, the poem chose the form. So yeah. So really fascinating responses from all of you, and and I think. One of the things that um, is coming up here is is thinking about a the organic way, the sort of sense of instinct that comes in when you're writing a poem. That the, the sound, there's a point where the poem takes over. I suppose is 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 what what um, seems to be a similarity in some of the responses. But also thinking about the reader's experience, and and that's really interesting. And um, you know, picking up on what Jim was saying about um, alopecia, that poem, and how you you kind of you know, the poem has a kind of mimetic effect and that's a really, really um, startling and wonderful poem as well. And then going back to the erasure, uh, yeah, Jen, I, I shared your experience. It, it kind of left me breathless reading that poem because I was looking for looking for the text um, within the text and, and then the surprise of seeing the poems lifted at the end. Um, one thing I was interested actually there, um, Nicole, was the use of punctuation all of a sudden in the poem, um, where we didn't have punctuation in, in, in things in, in, the, in the erasure. So it's sort of, it was interesting, suddenly there was a kind of a third, a third layer to it. You know, we were having a kind of an authorial um, thing coming in there directing uh, uh, us as well. And, and I found that in, interesting in two. And, um, and, and Courtney, um, yeah, that's really interesting hearing about the classified poem, which I think I've never seen a poem presented like that. So I found that really fascinating and hearing your influences with um, concrete poetry and how that, you know, how we visualize the poem. And I think that's that's really important um, and how how we want the reader to, I suppose, read the poem. And, and in many ways, all of your poems kind of teach us how to read them. It's one thing I was thinking as I was reading it, I, I felt like I was I was being taught by each poem how how I should read it anew. Um, so um, yeah, I think that leads me to a, a question around um, difficulty. I suppose uh, um, you know at what level do you you kind of you know bring difficulty in the poem? Do, does the poem you know immediately lend itself to being a difficult formally or playful, maybe you should say playful rather than difficult, um, or again, does that just sort of appear as you're writing it and you begin to think, I have an idea here, this is more than just, um, you know, this is more than just sort of impulse, there is a moment when I suppose the intellect or, uh, you know, another another hand kind of comes in. I remember the a review I got for a poetry pamphlet 
from 10 years ago and it was mostly very nice and then there was a line at the bottom which at the time oh it hurt (laughs) but now I think it's probably the best (laughs) piece of advice I'd ever been given and I'm going to paraphrase but it said something like um something like Jen Campbell the first draft is for you the second draft is for everybody else and like the the meaning had been lost communication had been lost somewhere in some of the poems between me and the reader and uh after I had a little cry about that, I put, my, <laughs> put myself together and thought, you know what, actually, fair. Um, and I was a little baby poet back then. And that's something that I think of all the time. And when I'm teaching, it's something that I pass on. So thank you to who, whichever review I said that, because that was kind. Um, so it is something I'm mindful of in editing, I suppose, um, which I'm not sure is related to difficulty, but I suppose that the communication aspect of a poem and being mindful about who it's for and um, and what it's saying, uh, I, I think that comes with the editing. Sometimes it comes all in one go if you're having a really good day, <laughs> but I think mostly it's about, um, yeah, the editing. Um, yeah, I would, I would, I would agree with that. Uh, and I think during the editing process, a lot of that, the organic nature of the poem starts to really show itself as well. It wasn't until I want to say draft 13 or 14 did object permanence want to want me to see that it was supposed to be in couplets. It mm-hmm. had been before that, I think, um, just a long kind of columny type of poem. Um, but the poem itself required a kind of intimacy that only couplets could provide, right? And so, of course, of course, couplets. And so I think um, absolutely I agree with with Jen in that uh, in the revision process, uh, you know, some of the organic nature of the poem starts to show itself what kind of music uh, should be in the poem, how, it wants to look on the page, what kinds of leaps it wants to take and um, what kind of what kind of diction should be included. And so, um, yeah, I think I think it's I think it's still organic even during the revision process. Right? But it's I still think, your brain, isn't it? Sorry, I was going to say it's still your brain. It's still you. Definitely. But I think we need to allow when I say we, I mean myself. <laughs> I need to allow um, the time it takes to get to draft 13 so it can it can transform itself into the poem that it wants to be. And so I think um, given time, a poem will show, show the poet what it wants to do and how it wants to look and what it wants to be. Yeah. Courtney, I had, I had a question um, uh, for you about whether this line was something that you came uh, back to and um, in the editing process or whether it was one of those organic lines because it's an image that I've underlined three times. (laughs) I loved it so much. It's a line where you say, he drags her body outside like a mic stand. It's my my favorite. I just love that, that that image of him using her to amplify himself um, or is something he can just drop um I thought it was it was so wonderful so I I wondered when that came in for you if you remember uh that on uh, it's not a good answer but unfortunately oh, no. it came in it came in the first um draft of it because the young man that I was speaking about in the poem um yeah he was a musician that I looked up to quite a lot um who was a neighbor of mine um so I kind of in the starting of drafting the poem together I kind of created a somatic field around like music um and then kind of created the images based off that so yeah that came naturally um in the first round of writing but thank you why is that not a good answer it's a great answer it just means you're fantastic <laughs> I I too uh, yeah picked up on that line it's an incredible line Courtney there, there was a line actually I, I wanted to ask about um in in the in the motherland poem, it's it's that wonderful transition you have when you say um, muscle memory goes back thirty years, and you know the poem is both doing that kind of double visioning thing of being the past and the present, um, and that you know such a powerful way of, of, of you know sort of doing that transition really. 
I'm glad that you thought it was good because I'm I usually as a poet struggle to transition during um like through time in my poems. So that would be something like my mentors would be like, actually, that's a little cheap, but I'll give it to you. Um so yeah, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. But yeah, um it was yeah, it was a cheat just to transition through time. Oh, well, it was a great cheat. And, that, and I, think, I mean, that's one of the big challenges that you, you all do so well is that, you know, the moment when, you know, the narrative uh, structure of the poem has to kind of fight with the voice. Does the voice want it to go in that direction? Um, and and voice is, is something that all of your work shares um, greatly, you know, um, in Nicole's work, you know, that you have poems that are kind of, um, there's that very long Cento poem where you're kind of engaging with there must be a hundred other American poets' voices in that poem, um, and the Cluedo poem as well, which has got that kind of voice apparatus of, of Cluedo. Um, it, you know, it's something about voice in all these books. Could, could all each of you maybe say something, something about that, how um, there's a kind of collective community of voices happening, whether they be the voices of um, neighbors in Jamaica, or voices of doctors or voices of the self in Jen's work as, as well. Might that be something that each of you uh, could talk about, please? Yeah, who wants to go first? <laughs> I mean, I, I can go. Um, really, it's just all the, the voices in my head, all my obsessions, everything that I've learned to date, every book that I've read, every conversation, every conversation that I've had, a mo movies that I've watched. And so, all these things form um, the the themes that are collected in the, in my in my books, right? Um, yeah, as I said earlier in our conversation, these are all my obsessions. These are these are all my obsessions, and so of course they'll show themselves in these in these works, right? Mm -hmm. I have a question, but but I'll let you all. Um, answer this question. I have a question for both Courtney and Jen at some point. Yeah, I think in regards to voices, I think I used a lot of the community voice just so that I could introduce power into the poems. Like I utilize the continuum of languages register from, you know, standard English to power. Um, and I guess I chose to do that, um, to write from a multiplicity of voices because, you know, injustice, has many problematic avenues and interrogating this, you know, should um, should not be monolithic or if, if, if that makes sense. Um, so that's kind of why I wanted to include um, the voices of the community, the parents, um, even politicians. So, yeah. I, I was in part surprised when I was writing this book in that the voice is very different to my first book, The Girl Aquarium, which is about girlhood, um, but isn't about um, disability and disfigurement as much. It's more about folklore and, and queerness. And I found myself writing not a huge number, but I think it's maybe about a quarter of that collection is in Geordie accent, which I do not have anymore. But I, I did when I was growing up. Um, and I lost it completely accidentally as an adult. I honestly feel like I, I don't know where I left it. It's somewhere. Um, but I enjoyed when I was writing that book, giving voice to my younger self through that accent in the book. And because I was writing about being queer as well, it almost felt like a code or a secret language, like a, a way of communicating again, like within a community. Um, and I, and I like that, but I did, I didn't feel I didn't feel the urge to do that as much in this, maybe because it's been now substantially much longer since I, I had that voice and there's something about it that, I don't know, it doesn't feel like mine anymore. Um, but uh, I I suppose enjoyed, enjoyed <laughs> giving voice to different ages of myself, but through a storytelling narrative. So there was that element of distance with the personal which I hope created some kind of balance as well as having, as you mentioned, the doctor voices and like the external shouting that um, creeps into some of the poems too. Oh, thank you all the br brilliant answers. And, and I'm just making some notes of things that are being said here, which are all brilliant. The, the monolithical, the point, um, 
Courtney Ray is there not to make it a monolithical poem to include these other voices. I think it's such a fascinating thing there. Um, and, and Jen, it's really interesting to hear about that, you know, um, transition, I suppose, that you see within your own your own voice, you know, and your own images that you're developing from, from the first book to the second book. Um, Nicole, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? I do have a couple questions. Um, the first of which is for, for Courtney. Um, you have such powerful endings. Yeah, you have such powerful endings and I'm just curious. And then of course, Jen began her first or second set thinking through endings. Um, how, how do we end a poem? So how did you, and this is, yeah. How did you come about these very powerful endings that are that feel not like an end, but a a door opening into another kind of thinking. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> are you right? Examples: the poem Shh, "Gunshot Can Pick Padlock" and the and also the "Path of No Papers" were really wonderful. And I mean, all of them, but those especially stood out to me. So gunshot, let me just quickly turn. So yeah, uh, so for Gunshot, that was actually two poems talking on the same theme, but I, uh, the original ending was um, the bit where it ends at sunshine, but the, the bit where the elders give the young woman advice on how to deal with um, domestic violence that came from another poem. And the reason why I decided to add it on to the end is because I wanted to talk about how community can also um, help but fail us at the same time. So here, these women um, kept quiet uh, and actually took a lot of the benefits from the um, assailant who was abusing the young woman. And then behind um, his back, they then gave like advice. And the advice wasn't to leave, it was more to, to essentially fight. Um, so I think I, it was very important for me to um, make sure that the elder's voice was also included just to show how, yeah, community can fail us, but also, um, supports us at the same time and both can be true at the same time if that makes sense yeah that would be such a different poem ending on sunshine that such was a, a last minute decision you know oh god it was so funny, but thank you and i have one for jen as well your book does a really wonderful job about um, kind of on that line of exploring uh, specimen versus spectacle. And I was just wondering about um, those themes in the book and how you not only came to them, um, but how you managed to make them communicate in such a way that just felt to me so honest and, and striking and powerful. Thank you. I think I've always been really interested in the history of the freak show. Um, I remember um, going all the time to this place in the Northeast, which if anyone is watching from the Northeast, you will know it. Actually, I think people travel from all over the country to go on school trips. It's a place called Beamish and I love it. With the, I love it so much. Uh, it's a living Victorian museum so everyone who works there is an actor and you can go into shops and you can basically walk around like it's the Victorian times and I remember going as a kid and you would go into this fake school and have a Victorian school lesson and you have to write on slate and everyone who was left-handed was forced to write with their right hand and it was terrifying because they were acting but as a seven-year-old you believe that it's absolutely true and that if you don't do it it's going to be terrible and I really struggled to write on the, the slate because I I'd recently had an operation and I was struggling to hold the, the chalk. And I remember someone else in the class, because um, we were talking about left-handed people and what they were made to do. And someone laughed and said, well, what would people like Jenny be made to do? 
like where would they be because I was getting told off for holding the chalk incorrectly um and the teacher was really embarrassed the fake teacher and said oh I don't know it's a good thing that we live in the the modern day isn't it I don't know and then we went outside and there's this Victorian fair and there were fake posters for freak show from the Victorian times I think it was the first time I'd ever really considered that anyone like me or anyone who was disabled could have been you know that that would have been the reality back then and I remember vividly equating that with how I felt being in doctor's offices and being looked at and examined and um, talked about like I was not really there um so uh yeah I've always been interested in body as spectacle and the history of the freak show and visiting the Hunterian Museum in London um in recent years where many people with disabilities are kept like their skeletons are kept and you can go and and look at them there was a man there called Charles who was called the Irish giant and he didn't want to be in the Hunterian Museum he knew that John Hunter was trying to collect disabled bodies and he paid someone to bury him at sea when he died but John Hunter paid more money and stole his body back and it's been on display in the Hunterian Museum for well, hundreds of years and there's been a petition recently to get Charles buried because that's what he wanted and it's been successful um, but yeah sorry I'm rambling but all of these thoughts about just how disabled bodies have been viewed as other and um, I wanted to explore that in here too because I felt going through the process of IVF that I was almost doing it myself because I was being forced to look at my own body in an external way that I hadn't done before I almost felt like I was having an out of body experience and that I was joining people and looking at my body as a spectacle and why is it working or not working in a certain way. And I kind of wanted to give voice to that. That was a clumsy answer. Thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for the question. <laughs> I have a question for Jen. Um, what was like, why was it important for you to introduce like playfulness in such like hard topics when talking about your experiences through your poems? Is that not what trauma does to us? That's what, I, yeah, because as a Jamaican, <laughs> culture wise, like I tried to introduce harm, um, humor, sorry, into mm. some poems because there's like this saying that says you can't take Jamaicans seriously. No matter what traumatic incident there is, we will find either a joke or a, some form of humor as a survival mechanism. So I just wanted to know, like, yeah, what your inspiration was behind including the playfulness. I think it is um, definitely a trauma response and, a, you know, that you feel like you can get heavy, but maybe not that heavy. And, you know, you've got to lighten it because um, you, I was going to say something that I think a therapist would have a lot to say, but I was going to say, because you want people to like you. <laughs> that, oh, that's that's interesting. Um, but yeah, that you kind of have to rein it back in a little bit. But I do think that you've got to do that to yourself as well at some points as well as, as just, as you said, like as a survival mechanism. And also I think, um, which I think is so brilliant in your work is that it, you can have that juxtaposition of, and it, it makes the heavy things more shocking if you can contrast it with something that is lighter. Um, so I think that's another reason as well. I think, would you agree with that with your work too? Absolutely. Yeah. I have a question for Nicole, actually. Um, I feel like in your book, I sit down with like a uh, highlight of studying how it is that you beautifully use form, but not allow it to hinder you from, you know, unleashing the voice of the very people that you're talking about. Um, I think you find a way to bend the tight regimented nature of form and allow for the voices to just really um be heard so can you like walk us through how to do that so I can take notes because it's beautifully done and it's oh good. my god I don't know I do not know um <laughs> by the grace of the gods um again you know poems require different things and so each poem in the collection even if you know they're part of the legendary series each legendary poem required something different of me right um required me to access the part of myself that um that needed to be accessed to complete the poem oh my goodness um so again I don't 
I don't know. I think it's important to to begin to to have all of the tools in your toolbox ready um, and at your disposal. And so studying all the things, you know, studying form, studying meter, studying all the things that that writers use to make make poems, right? Um, and so when you're um, having any kind of block, you're able to access these things, you know, access these tools from your toolbox. So all that to say, I don't know how I do anything. I don't know. It just, it happens, but it happens with, with a lot of work and a lot of revisions, right? Um, I think, I think allowing time to happen. One poem in particular, heretofore unuttered, um, I had been working on for maybe over a year before everything clicked and I was able to access the poem. I had to, I had to take a trip with my husband to Home Depot, which is like a home store to get like a plant and then have that plant on my desk. Think about that plant, look at how beautiful it is. And then the poem opened up. So I think, I think that poem required more living, right? Mm -hmm. It required more living. Um, and some some poems will need that, right? And and some poems that you're working on now, you may not have information for access to experience for as yet. You may need to live two or three more years before you are able to to fully engage with that poem. And I think that um, we need to allow that time to pass, right? And so I think. The long answer is um, A, I don't know, and B, I allow time to pass. Nicole, can I quote you? That was helpful. No, it is. Can I can I quote you back to yourself? <laughs> because uh, I was just yeah. looking at one of your poems as you were saying that um, in your poem in defense of candelabra with heads, and you said. Uh, each set of poems should click shut like a well-made box. And then you go on to talk about how um, it's not because I don't trust you, dear reader, or my own abilities. I ask because the imagination would have us believe much like faith, like to have faith in reading and writing. And I guess, and as you say, like in time and the evolution of poems and letting things breathe. I really love that poem. Thank you, Jen. I really love your book. Oh, we just all love each other. That's nice. <laughs> I love fest. I love a love fest. Also, ask another question. I'm a baby poet, so I'm here to get any knowledge you guys have. So you know what? I can't believe how how long you've been writing for because reading your book feels like you've been writing forever. It's incredible. Thanks. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> but um, how did you guys go about um ordering your your poems? Like. Mm. Talk me through the journey. Let me get my paper and pen and make some notes. But yeah, how did you go about that? You know, it's boring. Well, I mean, I, I did think about the the structure as I was talking before, like making sure that because there were house poems, I wanted to break those up with other things. And I didn't want all the medical notes to be in one section. And I knew that I wanted the beginning to be about childhood and a movement into adulthood and IVF. But what I also find fun about... Um, editing a collection and bringing it together is that is that extra step that I feel like people don't talk about and maybe it doesn't it can't happen all the time but for instance when Neil typeset the book there were some poems where the lines were too long to be um on on one page so it wasn't formatted the same so I had to think about how I could reformat a poem because i didn't love it going over into the next one how I could reformat a poem to say what I wanted it to say before but actually structured in a completely different way and then also because of the number of pages we needed one extra poem I can't remember which one it was but there's a two-page poem that was um, on a page turn initially and it looked clumsy, like it would have been better to have it on a double page spread. So Neil asked if I had another poem that could go in somewhere. And in my mind, the collection was finished at that point. So I was like, well, not that I was saying it was perfect, but I was like, well, put it, but I I put it to bed almost and I had to reopen it and think, OK, I think he initially just said, what could you move before then? So that and I realized I couldn't move anything. So I was going to have to add something. And the poem I ended up adding 
was um, a poem called, um, if I can remember, uh, it is called, oh my goodness, I can't. Oh yeah, when it arrives, it waves five. It weighs five kilograms, which is a poem about my requesting my hospital notes and them landing on the doormat. It's on page forty-eight, and that poem wasn't there at all until not the last minute, but very near the end of the editing process. And I, I in retrospect. I'm, I'm just glad it's there now because it makes a lot of sense for it to be there. And I think because it is about me requesting my hospital notes, it contextualized the fact that they're there at the beginning of the book. I don't think it would matter if that poem wasn't there and they were just there on their own, but I think it helps to explain to the reader, okay, I requested these things and that's why these are here. That's what they're from. So yeah, I mean, that's a, a, a less romantic version of the formatting of a book, but sometimes it is about the number of pages it is and how it looks. And you've got to play around with that sometimes. It's fun. Yeah. A really uh, wonderful question. And I think, I think you know, we, we kind of um, moving into like a masterclass, all of these wonderful, uh, you know, discussions about the act of writing and the organizing of writing. We just have a quick question from um, the audience. Well, we have two, two, a couple of comments actually. Neil Astley says, thank you for all the wonderful readings. I wish I could have been there with you this evening, but I feel I've been there as one of the live audience. Um, Sarah McKay Tam says, such strong narratives in all the poetry read tonight. Thank you so much for sharing. And the question we have is from Georgina Key, who asks, how on earth do you know when a poem is done though? When you hate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I often say to in workshops, if people are editing their work, I, I would maybe suggest saving them in different drafts because sometimes I can find myself over editing and wanting to go back a step. Um, but I think it's when you've left, and for me anyway, and I would love to hear um, your answers. For me, it's when I've left a poem long enough that when I go back to it several times, I don't feel the urge to change it anymore. It needs time. Um, and uh, sometimes I can think a poem is finished too soon and then come back to a week later and think, what was I thinking? It's not finished. Um, but yeah, time, I think, is my answer. I love that answer. And I also love, Jen, the quote or the paraphrase um, of when a poem is done that you mentioned earlier. I'm forgetting by who. Um, oh, Andrew McMillan. Yeah. yeah. When a collection is done, when you've looked at it from every single angle yeah I love that I love that I think um in addition to those two things when I think of when I mostly know that a poem is finished is when I start tinkering with its ending and it becomes uh not good you know I make the poem worse yeah. And so I, I I keep going back to that initial ending and so again when I'm tinkering and it makes the poem worse um, that's when I know that I've kind of exhausted the possibility of possibilities of the end. I think for me, it's more like if I ask whether the speaker would have wished they had time to add something else, then I know it's not finished. If I feel like the speaker feels like, okay, I've gotten everything off my chest for whatever it is I'm talking about, then I know, all right, I'm, I'm good, like closer to them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, three three wonderful answers to that question time um whether the speaker is finished and thinking about adding those last bits which undo and do the great work done so far so thank you um i think we're probably at, at time there but um but it's been a tremendous evening and, and thank you uh, to Courtney, Nicole and Jen, not only for your wonderful readings and your wonderful books, which are available from the Blood X Books website. So please do check out the link on YouTube and audio copies today. Um, do not delay. Um, but thank you so much for your time this evening, uh, for, for, for talking through how you wrote these books and some of the themes behind them, but also giving your advice about writing, which um, is definitely something I've found very fascinating and valuable too. And I hope, I hope those watching at home have found that valuable as well. So thank you very much. Oh, and I should say thank you also to um, Pete Hebden of Blood X Books and to Neil Astley as well. And we hope he is home soon, safe and sound. 
Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.